Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Day Mystics Show. Our mission here is to help you turn whatever you desire into real life manifestations by sharing our revolutionary technology in order to make that happen for you. We bring you such cutting edge information through our resident wizard, Peter Shank, and also through such magical guests each week that are really making a difference to improve our lives on a variety of levels. I am your co-host Donna, along with the founder of this program, the modern day mystic himself, Peter Shank. Peter, how are you? I'm doing well. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Special day for everybody. It uh, is. In our fashion, I'd like to kick off a water blessing for everyone. If you could please get a glass of water. This one is specifically for Mother's Day. I'd like everyone to take their left hand and raise it over the glass about three inches and spread your fingers. In a second, you'll feel the energy running down through your hand into the water. Please put your attention on the water and repeat the words out loud. I honor the space in which you exist. That energy will increase. Everyone go ahead and drink your Mother's Day water. Cheers. Donna, who is our guest today? Well, Peter, we have a fantastic guest today. Dimitri Morales is an accomplished metaphysical teacher, healer, and co-author of Communing, Communing with the Divine Karma and Reincarnation, The Healing Power of Your Aura, and Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. Originally trained in film, TV, film and TV, Dimitri redirected his life's work early to pursue the path of metaphysics. Having worked with Barbara Y. Martin and metaphysics for 30 years, Dimitri has been instrumental in organizing and teaching material bringing, and bringing spiritual arts institute to the place it is today. He's an elegant speaker on a wide variety of spiritual topics. He has lectured across the country, also appeared on numerous radio shows and teaches workshops and classes offered at the institute with Barbara. Dimitri, it's a real honor to have you on the MDM show. Change your oh, aura, you. change your life. How are you, sir? Oh, doing good. I'm glad to be here. How are you today? Busy. Busy. <laughs> that seems to be the way of the world right now. <laughs> have quite a few projects uh, in in the works and in different states of being completed. So, Wonderful. please tell us a little bit about yourself and your book. We have a. We actually just moved to North San Diego County to open a new center for metaphysical study, um, and you can take classes locally and in person. As you said in the bio, I work with Barbara Martin, and she is one of the world's leading aura specialists and clairvoyants. And we started the institute to really give a home for metaphysical studies. Um, originally, I did come to Los Angeles to work in film and television, and had a promising career there. And uh, I had this very dramatic, completely unexpected uh, spiritual awakening, I called it my uh, fall on the road to Damascus moment, and um, it, it changed the course of my life. And I started working with Barbara and metaphysics and meditation, and we both realized we were writers, and we started writing books together, and uh, it's been a marvelous journey ever since. Um, Change Your Change Your Life is really our flagship book because uh, we're in a series of writing seven books right now, but the Change Your Aura book is the foundation that teaches you the meditation to work with spiritual energy. And really the aura is the blueprint of the soul. It's showing all the energetic configurations of what's going on with individual, and that means everything. You know, people think of aura, I'm like a blue, I'm a green, I'm a pink aura. We're multifaceted beings in the aura. It's multifaceted. So there are many manifestations within the aura. Right now, what you're thinking is radiating a particular energy. What so, you're feeling is radiating a particular energy. Your talents are radiating energy. Your health is radiating energy. Your, your spiritual aspirations are radiating an energy. All of this is showing up right now, and it even spreads into career, into relationships. 
relationships and the finances, what's going on in your relationship shows up in the aura. So everything that's in your life is in your aura. And we call it change your aura, change your life, because one of the spiritual laws says that if an energy is in your aura, it will eventually show up in your life. In other words, if you have a real talent for something, for example, and it's radiating strongly in your aura, even if the immediate moment it's not showing, let's say, as a career or something, it will if that energy continues to stay strong there. So, if it's not in your aura, then you just have to create it. That's all. So, it's not, you know, it's a, fortunately, the aura changes. That's <laughs> our saving grace. So, Dimitri, let's rewind a little bit here. What is an aura? Okay, an aura is an, a, a vibratory essence that surrounds all living things. It's a spiritual energy flow that's moving in and around the person. Uh, we can call it the individual expression of the universal life force. There is a, a spiritual life force that's permeating all creation. It's, it's feeding all creation. It's, it's the power that's keeping even the atoms magnetized and in their place. And so, we will attract this energy according to the things we're doing in our life. So if you're a creative person, you're going to be attracting the energies of creativity as you're expressing your art or whatever it is you're doing. If you're a scientist, you're going to be attracting different kind of spiritual energies. Uh, your moods, if you're in a very happy, ecstatic mood, you're attracting that kind of joyful, exuberant energy. It's radiating in your aura. If you're angry and upset, what happens there is you take the divine energies that have come in and unfortunately have kind of dirtied them a bit. Uh, for example, if so, you know, we've all gotten angry. Um, one strong outburst of anger can linger for two weeks in the aura and it can show us kind of this sort of dirty red energy we call the vitiated red. So, so it's all there. You know, the aura doesn't lie. What, what, what does the aura look like? Because it, it's something that can be captured with, say, Carillion photography? Well, you know, the, the real Carillion photography, not, not the, some of the cameras that are out there now, it's not really Carillion photography, even though they seem to use that term. But the real Carillion photography that the Carillions created back in the 30s, uh, that was showing the beginnings of it wasn't the whole aura and it wasn't actually the aura itself it was the effect of the aura because the auric energy is not a physical manifestation but there was a fascinating uh, you know uh, study they did where they would take a leaf for example uh, they would put it on a photographic plate they would run a current through it and yes you would see this corona you would see this sort of aura around it but then they would also take a leaf and they would cut the leaf in half and then they would or they would wedge it they would create different things and then they would put it on the photographic plate and under the right conditions not only was the corona there but it would go around still where the entire leaf would have been showing that there was some type of a recognition that that original leaf was still somehow part of even though it was cut and this is what we call the etheric counterpart. You know, we have physical things have this etheric counterpart. Uh, even we have it. Uh, we've heard this about the phantom limb effect, that people that say that have lost a leg, sometimes they say, gee, it still feels like I've got my leg. And this has, because the etheric leg has not been lost. The etheric leg is still there, uh, even though the physical one is gone. So there are the beginnings. I think some of the best evidence right now is happening in energy medicine where a lot of doctors and researchers are are realizing that these complementary spiritual techniques for healing are having a demonstrable effect on patients we actually we had an article written on one of our healing techniques in a uh, in a journal that a doctor in Israel had been doing some research on uh, the complementary medicines for people going through cancer and he did a two-year study and he showed you know there is definite positive effect when you apply these principles and of course he wants to do more research into that area 
possible even if you took three months and you meditated, you know, uh, you know, diligently half hour a day, uh, let's say compassion, there would be a recognizable change in your brain structure as a result of that, what you did there. So they're starting to realize these things are having real effects uh, on us. And it's, it's nice to see because, you know, it's verifying what the mystics have been saying for ages. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the various colors that the aura are made up of, what do they mean? Well, that is really an interesting story. And if I don't mind backing up just for a moment about Barbara, you know, she was starting to see the aura at age three. Uh, but she didn't know what it meant. She didn't know what the colors meant. So we're, remember, we're many colors, not just one. And some of them are very beautiful, radiant, and some of them are not so wonderful. And so she would be attracted to people who have these beautiful, bright colors. And she'd be detracted to people who had ugly colors, but she couldn't figure out why. Uh, one time, her father of all things was a Greek Orthodox priest, and they were inaugurating a big cathedral. And the archbishop was there, and the bishop, and it was all a big deal. And of course, the family was there prominently. And little Barbara, again, not knowing what the colors meant, <clears throat> was looking at the aura of the archbishop, and it was these grotesque colors. It was not pretty. She was shocked. And the, the bishops had beautiful auras, but not the archbishop. So when it came time to kiss his hand, as you do at the end of a service, she yelled in front of the whole congregation, oh no, I'm not kissing his hand. He's a monster. He eats children. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that was the beginning of many spankings. <laughs> you know, her mother was horrified. So, does the does the aura have the capacity to change? So you you mentioned that if Absolutely. you get if you get angry, Absolutely. it stays with you for two weeks. Um, so right. if, if if I got angry, my aura would change to red, and that would that would stay with me for two weeks. Right. But is it possible? Your aura change really slowly, but other parts change quickly with your thoughts. So that's your saving grace. You know, we're never stuck with the aura the way it is. If we notice some character traits in us that are not the best. We don't have to just say, well, you know, that's me, that's the way I am. We don't have to accept it that way. We can say, okay, this is where I am right now, but I can change this. And there are two basic ways you, you change your aura. One we've been doing from the beginning of time, which is through every good word, thought, act, and deed. Every positive thing we do is adding to our energy field, even if we're not getting patted on the back for it. And the other way, which is what the emphasis is in the book, is through meditation. Through meditation, you can receive these divine energies, which is what they are, and enhance your auric field. So let's say I'm not feeling very confident right now. Let's say I have to talk about the projects you're working on. Maybe I'm working on a project. I'm thinking, oh, this will never happen. Why did I even start this thing? And I'm losing kind of my, you know, my, my get up and go. I think oh, about yeah. that every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every day. Well, work with the goal. Work with that goal, which is a very, very dynamic energy and will help you get through it. You know what Beethoven said about music, writing music, right? 3% inspiration, 97% perspiration. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the idea is that something can come real quick. You know, we wrote, this is actually a revised edition of the book. We This book has actually been out for... It's a bestseller. It's been out for years now. And when we we originally wrote it, I thought, oh, gosh, this thing's going to write itself. I mean, we got the master here. I've been so well trained. And it still took two years. Yeah. Because to find the, the, the voice, it's very different, you know, writing something clearly as opposed to, like, talking right now. And also realizing, let's say, those illustrations in the book, they were very meticulously done because for years, the artist couldn't capture what Barbara was seeing, and we realized because it's so intricate. And it's not like just, you know, the artist would create the embellishments and said, oh, this is, that's, it's like Grey's Anatomy. A liver has to look like a liver. Um, so, yeah, you can definitely, you know, our, we recommend that you meditate daily, even if it's 10, 15 minutes a day. Make you see, it like brushing your teeth, I, I, and you will see the cumulative effect. I, I have a problem with meditating. For me, after my wake up experience, I could see the energy and everything, whether it was physically around me or, or somewhere else. 
And the, the, the meditation part just never really jived with me, but I, I do appreciate you, you know, telling the listening audience about meditation because for a lot of people, it does do a lot of good. Just for me personally, it doesn't work. When I need to attract energies into my aura, I just really fixate on it at the speed of thought and then it's done. And Well, remember sometimes actually in a way, the way you opened what you did today was, was um, almost what we would call a meditative prayer. Mm -hmm. Yes. You recited something verbally, but you were also asking for something to be received. And that's exactly the way we do our, what we call our light meditations. You're not, meditating is a state of receiving. Prayer is a state of petitioning. Mm -hmm. So when you're meditating, you're receiving. Now remember, yes, things can travel with the speed of thought, as you say, but remember, sometimes it takes a while to let those energies establish in you. Because what, when you're calling on light, what you're really calling on is consciousness. So let's say if I'm, I'm not feeling very loved right now. I'm feeling like I got the short end of the lollipop here. You know, <laughs> I'm in a consciousness of loneliness. I'm a consciousness of sadness or whatever it is, disappointment. I can call on the consciousness of love, which comes in as that deep rose pink. As it enters my aura and the various facets of it, I'm going to start to feel that love if I've done my meditation right. And that will change my consciousness. We could have called this change your consciousness, change your life, <laughs> you know, because uh, light and consciousness are walking hand in hand. But we do have to be a little patient with ourselves because, you know, you can't always switch gears that fast. So because it's not only going to the mind, it's got to go to all the levels of your consciousness. And sometimes the one that's the hardest to change is the emotions. Uh, emotional, the emotional part of us moves at a much slower pace than the mind. And we've got to let that energy kind of establish our emotions. I call it, it's like a freight train. You know, once you excite them, you can't just change your feeling on a dime. You have to kind of let yourself calm down. And as we say in the book, if you ever try to reason with somebody that's in a rage state, you know, you can't do that because they're not thinking at that moment. They're, they're just expressing what they're feeling. Well, you know, yeah. it, I, I have an interesting example of that, and I do believe you can change it at the speed of thought, and I'll tell you why. I used to commute to work for 20 years, and I have been involved with and have seen a lot of road rage out there. And one time I was driving to work, and I probably did something I shouldn't have done. I cut somebody off and he got very upset very quickly and pulled up next to me, rolled down his window and was just screaming blasphemy at me. And I looked at him and I just blew him a kiss. And instantly, I mean, instantly his entire demeanor changed. He just started laughing and gave me a thumbs up and that was the end of it. You have to remember that one. <laughs> you know, living in LA in the city. Oh, <laughs> well, there they might. <laughs> so, wh why is the aurora important in our lives? Well, it's the energetic foundation for everything. Uh, we all know it takes energy to do anything, and the place you generate that energy is your aura. So it doesn't matter if you see it or not. It doesn't matter if you even know it's there or not. It's there, and it's creating everything. So. Whenever you're building any skill for anything, you're not just also the skill, you're also building the energy to be successful at that career or whatever it is you're engaging in. So we're really encouraging people to take more time to build up their auric power because it will have a corresponding effect in the life. And it can be in any area you can make that change. It's not just one area, you know, your career or your finance. It could be an emotional state. It could be a mental state. It could be... Uh, uh, anything, anything you want to create. And some of the things we added in this updated edition was how it can help your evolution. You know, the, we have a soul, we're a soul inhabiting a body, and this soul is here to grow spiritually. So all the things that are happening in our life are part of the spiritual unfoldment, and you can help accentuate that by working with the energies. Uh, we also added a new section about color and fashion, that the colors you wear in your clothing can have a positive or detrimental effect on your aura. Oh. Uh, so about children, you know, it seems like lately a lot of people are asking about, gee, what can I do for my kids? You know, yes. if, if they're either asking about these things because they're seeing things or they'd like to teach them to meditate more. And with children, it does seem like there's, they're getting smarter and smarter and they seem to be more awake and more alert and more aware of the spirituality of life. Um, but one thing does have to remember, just like a child's body is growing,
change after that, but the pattern does become more static. Um, so there are there's some techniques we show in there. We also went a little bit into the aura of animals, and animals have auras, and when we have pets, it's not just about, you know, hugs and kisses, but you're actually helping that animal in its evolution through your love and the energy exchange that goes on between you and the animal. Um, so we, we really try to paint a really well-rounded picture of all the different facets of what the aura is about. Now, is, is it possible that anyone can learn to see an aura? It is, but I'll be honest with you, it's, it's very difficult um, to really, really see it. Now, people involuntarily see it, or I should say they don't exactly see the aura, they see colors of the aura. So, you you know, you may be even walking down the street and suddenly you see this blue light, you know, you say, oh my God, what's that? And this has been a lot of the things that helped awaken people that they have had these experiences. Um, but we say, you know, clairvoyance is a byproduct of our evolution. We're all inherently clairvoyant. We all have this inner side potential, if you want to call it that. It's just in many, it's been, it's, it's latent that needs to be developed. And, uh, you know, in the ancient days, there would be these ashrams, well, even the ashrams are around today, but there would be these mystery schools and ashrams, and you basically went there to dedicate your life to your spiritual studies and to learn to awaken these inner faculties. That's very, very cool. So I look at Donna, and I just see a happy aura. But you're interesting, <laughs> and, and, and this is very Thank much on the way. Thank you. But your 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 aura is very golden, but you have a dark purple that runs on the inner side of it. What does that mean? And this is you, well, Dimitri. Purple is a sign of peace. And Yay! It means, uh, either you're a peaceful person or at peace with yourself. Uh, it's an important energy to have, especially today when there's so many tensions in the world. Um, you know, we have to kind of learn to be in the world, but not of it. You know, it's like we're in a storm, but we're in the I, the, the peace in the midst of the storm. Yeah. You can call, call it purple, by the way, if you are feeling uh, stressed or pressured, it'll it'll bring you into a state of peace. Now, what, what does the golden part of it outside the purple mean? Well, gold is the dynamic energy. It does show, um, you know, uh, willpower. It does show wisdom. It does show uh, a confidence. Uh, we all want to develop this. This is something... I was really strongly emphasized through the years to, you know, when you're walking with God, you know, it's my father and I are one. And so there should be a sense of confidence because you're going to need it in this life. There's too many things that are going to try to trip you up or tell you you can't do this or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's going to be times where you're just going to have to assert yourself and say, no, this is the way I'm going to do it. So, so then it, you're saying it is possible to work with the aura even though you can't see it? See, the, the, I, I have a problem digesting a lot of the information that guests give us on the MDM show 
particularly because I take a lot of things for granted because to me they're just second nature. And I really only utilize that skill set when developing products that go out in the world and, and, and help people. So what's interesting is, you know, one of one of the, the gifts that I had after I woke up was the gift of sight. I can see the energy at the speed of thought and anything. And as you're talking, I'm fixated on your aura. And I'm watching it change as you know these you know the, 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 you're you're talking through the phone and it's coming over and the show is you know live and then being recorded and but the the energy waves that are coming out of the the thought forms in your head are directly affecting your aura color and they keep going from the the dark purple and jumping back into that golden band it's just really kind of cool to watch that. You know, from obviously someone that knows everything about the the auras. Right, and right. Well, you know, I mean, we prepared this session today too, so the higher is kind of helping right now as well. So, the, you know, we do that with every interview. So, we actually, do that with every class. It's, so oh, there's another, that would be a whole other subject talking about the spiritual hierarchy. But the way these light energies reach us is not by osmosis; they're they're sort of sent to us, and so. Um, it's interesting you're tuning into that. We would just encourage you to work even more with your aura. <laughs> you know, it, Barbara was seeing the aura at age three. She got her first training at 11, but she wasn't teaching till her 30s. So it was 20 years, and she worked with some high-powered teachers to, to train. You know, for example, she did nine months just on concentration uh, to be able to do kind of what you're mentioning now, not caught up with somebody else's energy. Let's say you're doing a reading so many other energies in the room uh it's easy to see other things that are happening at the same time and to separate that you know it's kind of like radio stations making sure you're zooming in on the right one and also the right aspect of the aura which which manifestation within the aura are you going to be focusing on so uh it would be interesting you know to, to see what let's say you're picking up and i'm sure your your higher nature is helping you too right now oh absolutely you know, So if you if if a person can't see their own aura, how do they know what it looks like? Well you you you're touching on it before. I would go over that color chart, you know, that's in you the placement of the color reveals a lot where it is in the aura. The shade and hue of the color is enormously important. So as I mentioned before, Barbara, you know, was seeing was seeing words but didn't understand what they meant. She was 11. She had an experience. Uh, she was in a theater company, and the teacher called her in one day and basically said in private, "You can see the aura, can't you?" And her, she was shocked. And she said, "Oh God, is that what it's called?" And she said, "I can see the aura too. I'm a hermetic scientist, and my mother and grandmother are hermetic scientists, and I want to teach you about what this means." And one of the things you know, Dorothy taught Barbara was about color interpretation. So understanding the definition of colors. So let's say, yes, I did get angry. You know, you can cre you create probably some dark red. You don't need to see that to know it's there. Uh, you mentioned the gold. If you're feeling confident, there'll be some gold. If you're feeling very creative, there's going to be that electric blue. Um, the, also, the prosperity energy, there's actually a color prosperity in the aura. So what we tell people is sort of take a little evaluation of yourself. Be honest, it's just you. You know, no one's, no one's judging you. And you can pretty get some basic color ideas. And if you notice there is something like, gosh, you know, I, I get afraid a lot. Okay, maybe you do create a little gray in the aura. Uh, work on that. You can release that energy and build up that power and bring in more of, again, the courage or whatever it is that you need. But how do you change it? Well, it is changing, just like you're kind of observing now through your your actions and activities. So if I go out and help somebody right now, I'm actually changing my aura because of the energy it took involved to do that. I'm making it better. If I steal money from somebody, I'm also degrading my aura through that action. But again, in the meditative state, what we actually do is literally call on the energy, draw it into the chakras of the aura, but then we have to go out and live it. So we had a doctor in one of the classes once, and he was, you know, very honest. He said, you know, I don't, I, I don't really have a, a lot of enough compassion for my for my. Patients. 
patience when I've seen them. I just sort of run through the day and I don't feel like I'm making a really good connection. So, you know, we recommended, well, work with that pink rate, bring in that loving energy and take the time to show more care for your patients. And so he worked with it, but he brought in the energy, but then he actually had to take that time. Okay, let's go a little slower. Let's find out what he had to do. He had to show that. He had to demonstrate. You know, we tell people, a truth is not truth until you're living it. It doesn't matter how, how smart you are. It doesn't matter how well you understand the idea. There are people that understand these ideas, but they can't actually do them. Oh, forgiveness. I mean, we've been talking about that for ages, you know. Uh, but we can say, I know I need to forgive this person, but we haven't actually done it yet. So once we're living the truth, then it's a permanent part of our auric field. So changing your life changes your aura and vice versa, yeah? Is that a true statement? Right, right. In other words, um, if you're noticing a weakness in your in your life, yes, so it can go both ways in the sense that as you take positive action, it will affect in your aura. As you build up more power in your aura, it'll affect your life. All right, so here's one for you. I have a weakness for carbs. I love pizza and pasta. How can I change my life? <laughs> <laughs> How can I change my aura to move away from that? <laughs> well, we would say that, you know, first of all, we have a taste for it. Those are good things. Uh, you're, uh, I don't know how many have shared probably that exact same thing, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a pattern. You've developed, obviously, a taste for it. Um, we could say, well, you could call on a purifying ray if you feel like it's detrimental to you. That's one thing if you just want to do it, but if you feel like, gosh, you know, it's not a thing. I, like I think I like to do something for more health reasons. You would figure out, well, why are you doing it? You know, so you can work with the orange red flame to really I know why I'm doing, doing it. it. <laughs> you know why I'm doing it? You like the taste of it, yeah. <laughs> so here's and an interesting... And the goal is for willpower again. There's that goal coming in again. It can help you. Sometimes we know we need to change it. It's I want to quit smoking or something like that. Um... You know, we have the recognition of it, but we don't have the willpower to carry it out. So, is it possible that not everyone has an aura? Oh, no, everybody has an aura. Everybody has an aura, and everything has an aura because the life force is in everything. Even mm. the fool you're talking to right now has a little bit of an aura because the atoms in there are active with life force, and they're collectively radiating an energy. Animals have an aura, plants have an aura. You know, it's it's everywhere. It's every God's light is everywhere and in everything. The very atoms in your body are being supported by spiritual energy. If it was withdrawn for even a moment, the body would disintegrate. So, all right, that that touches on a good point. What is spiritual energy? Oh boy. Okay, this is this is a this is the <laughs> test question we give in all our classes. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, <coughs> answer is the it's a, a conduit of consciousness actually spiritual energy is a divine light and it is transporting consciousness from one aspect of creation to another we have come to understand that thoughts travel i can send a thought to you you can send a thought to me um but actually consciousness itself can be shall we say transmitted so as you're working, again, right now we're in a state of consciousness, so we're, we're focusing on something. But if I'm recognizing I'm in a consciousness of sadness or despair or whatever happens, these universal life energies bring in these higher states of consciousness. And eventually it can lead to what we call the enlightened state, where the entire aura is enlightened, all the various facets of it, shall we say, become awakened, and we do become this enlightened soul and that is actually the destiny of all of us sooner or later we're all going to get to this enlightened state and the reason you know this this is a wonderful time though higher tells us this is one of the best times to grow spiritually because there is this global awakening that's happening right now which means that many souls are saying it's time for me to climb the spiritual ladder and that's what we tell people you know I'm sure most people listening to the show, they're doing it because they had a spiritual experience or they had an awakening. They had something that told them there's more to life and I need to learn about this. Well, that's not accidental. You know, that's the divine knocking on your door. Your, your experience, what you're seeing, this is not accidental. This is the higher knocking on your door. You know, so we just tell people, follow through, do whatever you need to do. Start the radio show, you know, work on whatever it is. Follow through on it 
because that will lead to some pretty exceptional things. Uh, you know, I was in the world of film, and uh, I would say, you know, <laughs> film sort of a jealous mistress. You know, I watched you completely, shall we say. And when I had my awakening, uh, I, I just it changed the course of my life. And the same for Barbara. She was actually interesting enough in show. Gonna, she was offered this wonderful contract in show business, and she was about to take it. And the hire came and said, "That's not your destiny. You're meant to be a spiritual teacher." And she had to let that go, which was not an easy thing to do. So follow your passion, follow your bliss, as they say, and they can lead to some pretty exciting things. So how would you describe, or actually, how does spiritual energy help with healing? Well, because the body is first an energetic configuration. We have to realize the body's being, you know, we need air to breathe, we need to drink water, we need to eat. We deprive ourselves of these things. We die, you know. But the, even beyond that, there is the spiritual component. It's the source of all the healing energy. So uh, when you draw on, when there is a disturbance, let's say, for example, the color of illness in the aura is sort of a gray. It's a devitalizing energy. And if you see the gray in the aura, it's either the person is already sick or they're literally on their way of a physical manifestation of illness. Um, again, start to work with the energies to but build up the healing current is it, in the, in is the it, body it, now because Dimitri. the body is responding to the light too, not just the mind and the emotions. The physical body is responding to the light, and you can build up more power in the body. I mean, the, the, the story of Yogananda, you know, the, the Indian mystic, and when he died, his body did not decay. Um, because he had spent his whole life building up so much power, you know, in his consciousness that it was even the atoms in the physical form were very strong. And even though he left his body, that exhilaration was still in the in the body itself. Sure, you didn't. So we sure you didn't recommend have, working with energy for healing. Sure, you didn't have a lot of preservatives there. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I don't know what they did to him. <laughs> so, is there is there any room for error? in what you do when reading an aura? Oh, oh, there's a lot. Well, you, first of all, um, I can, you know, as I mentioned, Barbara spent decades in training before she became a teacher. Because there is, if you're, there's a difference between being a trained clairvoyant and an untrained clairvoyant. Because untrained, yes, you don't know really why you're seeing what you're seeing. Uh, you're just seeing it. And some of it can be accurate, and some of it, you're right, can be inaccurate. Um, but to do it in a trained way, uh, she, you know, she worked with a, a teacher in Los Angeles who will prepare her to, to be a teacher. She said, you know, you're, you're going to get an lecture from a talk about this. And it was a very, very diligent process. I mean, the training she's been doing for me, I, I can tell you this is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, to try to really do this in a, in a systematic way and, as you say, be accurate with it. So, but the, so yeah, I know it's a difficult skill. I, I, will, I will belittle it when you're trying to really say, oh, that's really what's going on there. And always anybody, you know, if anybody goes to anybody for advice, you in the, in the spiritual arena, you always take it with a grain of salt. You know, you, you never accept things blindly. Even Barbara says, don't accept anything. I say blindly, you know, put it to the test yourself. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. And that should be for all of us that, a lot of people come for consultations and they say things like, gee, can you tell me what my life purpose is? And you shouldn't be asking that question. That's your, you have to discover that. <laughs> you get some insight, but you know, it, it means nothing coming from somebody else. It, it, it has to come from you. Absolutely. Yeah. So working with spiritual energy, can it help people grow spiritually? Oh, that is the bottom line. You know, metaphysics teaches that Earth is a school. We're here for a short period of time. You know? <laughs> we're going to come in and we're going to leave. <laughs> Just like any school, you don't stay in school forever. So everything here is related to your growth, to understanding the spiritual dimensions of life, to serving your purpose, and we all do have a purpose. So yes, one of the big things about the awakening is realizing it's not just about having a job, it's not just about making money, it's not just about getting married, 
the same having kids or whatever. There's something that's behind all these activities. There's something driving all of this. There is a purpose to life. It's not random. It's not haphazard. There is an order to things. We may not always understand what that is, but as we seek it, we do find. There's a beautiful ancient teaching that says the seeking of the philosopher's stone that's the condition to find it. You know, and we we have to seek our answers in life and the seeking creates this spiritual transformation that we're that we're aiming for. I don't I don't understand that. Can you uh can you rewind the that next the philosopher's stone, you mean? Yeah. I'm just still a little bit confused about this analogy in the Philosopher's Stone. I understand the Philosopher's Stone has two meanings. One, it is a piece of material that has a nine-month birthing process that, when completed, kind of looks like a piece of amber. And you take a piece of that off about the size of a pea and you bang it into lead. And exponentially, it will create 20, or 20 tons of the purest gold in existence. Or two, it's the elixir of immortality, which again has a nine-month birthing period. So either one of those is irrelevant to the conversation. But when you use it in the context of what you're talking about, I am still not clear okay. on how well, it applies. I'm, I'm speaking more, uh, uh, maybe say metaphorically, um, you know, in the hermetic sciences, um, it's not really about turning base metal into gold. It's about the base metal is the unawakened aspects of our soul. And the precious, I mean, the lead is the unawakened part of our soul. And the precious metal is the alchemical transformation that happens to turn us into an enlightened being. So really, the way I'm referring to it now is the process of going from the unenlightened state to the enlightened can only happen when you're seeking it. It's not going to just sort of happen by itself. So the, the it. journey is actually the transformation. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. You know, when Buddha left the, or Siddhartha left the palace to find the answers to life, they didn't come right away. He spent years searching for it. He almost died in the process. And then finally he reached his enlightenment. And then his mission began. So we have to seek with all our heart and mind and soul, and that will lead us to our glory. So you mentioned the first seven years of a child's life. Give me that, and you can take the rest. How does that, you know, form with, you know, can I teach my children to meditate with divine light? Are we are those two kind of on the in the same space, in, in correlation to what that comment was before? Well, they're they're complementary. I mean, it does say, you know, for for parents, you know, of course, love your children always, but be especially attentive in those early years because so many things are happening to the child during that time. So your your attention is there and now. Some children show a desire for this, some do not. But we definitely say don't push anything on your kids, especially in this area. Except clean your room. Go to your room and meditate with your children. 
dead. Oh, your aura is red. Yeah, you didn't clean your room. <laughs> 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 so, children as reflective meditation, not quite the meditation we teach for adults, but there's a reflective where you play sort of games with them, like let's say, you know, let's envision this beautiful golden bubble and it's protected and it's protecting you and it's, you know, you make it kind of fun a little bit. But kids are very smart. We used to teach to uh, acting uh, students for children in LA, and these are really sophisticated kids. I mean, one list of, you know, the voice of Finding Nemo. And I couldn't believe how they were so open to the idea of the aura. And we, you know, yeah. we mentioned, you know, uh, the color of talent in the aura is electric blue. Well, the host, she said, next day they came to the workshop and they were all happy we're all wearing blue, you know. <laughs> so they got it, you know. Kids can be literally faster than us. And that's, it's like, uh, um, but you want it to be gentle. You don't want to push it on them. At 12 years old, they get with that higher self point that I was talking about and they enter into puberty and then you can teach the full meditation at that point if they really want to learn what we call the six steps of downrange line of accessing the higher self meditation if then then you can teach them that and they'll be ready for it and of course up to then you're teaching them principles you know, you know spiritual principles ethics or you know all the things that are important these things really really count you're you're really helping that soul, remember it's the adult soul in that little body. It's not, it's a little body, but it's not a little soul. It's the full soul that's coming in and it's phasing in its power over time. And it's the, 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 the parent is the usher. It's helping the soul come to the earth to go to school, to learn the lessons of life it came here to learn. Yes. Hey, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Okay, so here's a question. So, can auras intermingle? So, if I have a partner, I'm in a relationship, are, are our auras intermingling? Does that make sense, Dimitri? Oh, yes. Oh, you better believe it. We live in a sea of energy, and we're constantly intermingling, and you do have to be strong because you have to decide what energy you want to enter your aura and what you don't. Now, yes, the closest two auras come is like during, you know, kissing and intimacy and things like that. So be careful who, you know, you invite to your bed because Absolutely. you're inviting all the energy associated with that. Mm -hmm. Make sure you want that energy around you. We actually say when you're, when you're doing, you know, the intimate acts, ask the white light to bless the experience. So it's an uplifting thing for everybody. Uh, but also other things can happen. I mean... You know, someone comes to you with their troubles, and you, you're you're good friends, and you talk to them, and they feel great, and at the end you're exhausted. Well, you know, they pull on your energy, uh, and you have to be careful there. Um, no energy can enter your aura unless you want it to happen. And we all know how wonderful a positive exchange can happen between people. You feel like you're walking on the cloud. We also know how debilitating, you know, a, a destructive argument can be because it can tear at the energy. Uh, but you can you can be strong there. You can refuse. If someone's especially trying to, you know, pull a con on you or try to do something that then you, you you're gonna do it this way, um, you you have to you can put an energy, you put a golden bubble around yourself and you just you know it's silent, like you say, I refuse it. I refuse everything that's being projected. I do not accept it. Uh, we can do that, but we have to exert that. We have to say I want this or I don't want this, and that will help in the exchange of energy with others. How can the aurora be used, Dimitri, to increase one's prosperity? Well, this is, this is startling in a way to realize is that there's an actual color of prosperity in the aura, and it's a brilliant turquoise light, which means that prosperity is first a consciousness, it's an awareness. Mm -hmm. If you are in the awareness of prosperity, it will manifest. This is where people often don't realize this. In other words, if I'm constantly worried about money all day long, you kill the flow. So I'm creating that, you know, that gray energy, and it's going to be harder for that wealth to manifest. Whereas if I'm thinking prosperously, even if it's not immediately showing in my life, again, if I'm constant and with it, it will. Uh, when I first met Barbara, as I mentioned, I was in the showbiz world, and it's kind of peace and famine there. You know, either working all the time like crazy, or you're not working at all. And I was in one of those quiet periods, and she looked at my heart chakra and said, oh, my God, 
there's this beautiful turquoise light there. That was the prosperity ray. Well, at that exact moment, nothing was manifest. But two weeks later, literally, it's one of the best jobs I had up to that point. It come into my life, and it was already in the aura. It was, it was already brewing. It just took a little bit to show, you know, in the outer manifestation. So this the same the same technique can be used to bring more love into your life, yeah? Right. Yeah. Yeah, if you want a relationship, pink, pink, nothing is more attractive than love. Not looks, not money, not a, you know, the most attractive thing is that loving connection. And you can bring that energy in there. It also does, you know, visualization, as many schools have taught, is very important. Visualize the quality of the person you want. What you know, you want a sense of humor, integrity. You know, uh, you know whatever it is that that's important to you, and that does set an energy in in the universe to help bring it towards you. But you also do have to be supportive of it. You know, some people start really great with this, but then you know, to, uh, then they get discouraged. So yeah, that's why we do recommend the daily meditation because yeah, sometimes you know life throws us a few zingers there, and kind of going back for to the well for water, so to speak, helps keep you in that positive flow. You know, you, you know, I want to touch on meditation quickly, and I'd like you to bring your expert advice to the table. I don't meditate because my mind races very very quickly, and I don't see any benefit out of meditating. So with, with that said, how, you know, you've brought up meditation many times in, in our time together tonight, and I'm just curious what techniques you would recommend for the listening audience, so, you know, in terms of meditating. So, Dimitri, we are coming to the end of the MDM show for tonight, and I would like you to let people know how they can get in touch with you and get a hold of your book. Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's a delight to be here, and thank you for such an intelligent conversation, and um, 
yes, our website is spiritualarts.org. Our phone number is 1-800-650-AURA, A-U-R-A. Uh, we do have a workshop coming up, a free one, a webinar on May 6th. Uh, and we're having our grand opening in June online and in person of the, of the center and all that we're doing. Of course, the book just came out, and Change Your Order, Change Your Life, you can get on Thank that. Thank you, uh, and Anywhere, it's, it's Penguin Tarcher released it. So uh, we welcome you to, to learn more about it, lectures, workshops, consultations, healings. We, you know, we're doing a lot at the Institute right now. Awesome. Well, Dimitri, thank you very, very much. Author of Change Your Aura, Change Your Life on the MDM Show. Thank you for joining us. Really, really appreciate it. Everyone, thank you. Have a good evening and happy Mother's Day to everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Here's the book. Make sure you get a copy of it. <laughs> Yay. Good night, Dimitri. everyone. It was wonderful having you. Good night, good night.